Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Welcome to the FSH Adjunct Professor Lecture Series 9. So hi, I am Dr. Nur Shafika binti Abdul Rahim, your moderator for today's. And I am from the School of Human Resource Development and Psychology. So Today, we will present it to you, our two amazing speakers who are Datuk Zunaida Idris and her invited guest speaker, Mr. Azran Osman Drani. And they will share with us the story of what is financial freedom invest in wealth and health. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our event for this afternoon, I would like to invite Dr. Nasi Masroom from School of Human Resource Development and Psychology to lead us in the recital of Doa. Let's welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and very good afternoon. We start this talk series by recite Al-Fatiha. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Ma'alik Yawiddin Iyaka Na'bud wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladhina An'amta Alayhim Ghairil Maghubi Alayhim Waladhalim Amin Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Asrafil Amya Iwal Mursaleen Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'in Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, we gather in this blessed afternoon with full devotion and humble. We seek your blessing and guidance so that we are endowed with health, strength, determination, consistent and trust in carrying out the tasks entrusted. Ya Zuljidu al-Ikram, Ya Allah, who control all greatness and glory, please Bestow this program with your grace and protection to enlighten our heart and mind to receive knowledge, information, guidance, and the truth. Make us knowledgeable and noble person who can lead the civilized society. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana inna ka antal alimul hakim. Glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. Verily. It is you, the all-knower, the all-wishes. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmah wa hayyik lana min amrina rashada. Oh Lord, bestow us on mercy from your presence and give us guidance to safeguard our matters. Rabbana aftah banana wa bayna khawmina bil haqi wa anta khairul fatihin. Oh Lord, judge with truth between us and your people for you are the best all of judges. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa salam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alam Amin amin ya rabbal alamin Thank you Dr. Nasi Mashroom for the doa Now we will be we will be very grateful to have our honorable deen with us this afternoon session. Professor Dr. Zaidah Tontase to deliver her welcoming speech. Let's welcome Prof. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Nur Shafiqah Ibrahim uh, as our moderator for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you in Facebook and in YouTube to our FSS Adjunct Professors Lecture Series Series 9. To both our uh, prominent speaker, Yang Mubahagia Datuk Zunaidah Idris, Deputy Chairman, MDDN, M Investment Committee, and also our former SVP Hong Kong Leong Investment Bank. And Datuk Zunaidah is one of our adjunct professors to represent from School of Human Resource Development and Psychology. Welcome, Datuk, and thank you very much for accepting our invitations for 
FSS adjunct professors lecture series, series number nine. And of course, we have a second prominent speaker with a special invited guest, Mr. Azran Osman Rani, co-founder and CEO of Nal Naluri Life Sediam Berhad. And I would like also to thank the committee members of this FSS adjunct professor series from Sharp, headed by Associate Professor Dr. Siti Aishah Panatik. Thank you very much to all our friends from Sharp have to, to have this FSS adjunct professors for lecture series number nine. Well, uh, the topics today is financial freedoms, invest in wealth and health. And this is not only the topics that we should share with all of our students. And this is a topic, it's a very interesting topic that we should share to the whole uh, members of UTM, also to the whole members of Malaysia. And through through online mediums that we have uh, nowadays, uh, due to because of pandemic COVID-19, we can have this session as frequent as we have. And for uh, all who attend our sessions today, the adjunct professors lecture city is one of our impact initiative that we actually embark uh, start, started last year and then we keep continuing to invite those people from industry to share uh, any of their experience and any of the information related to industries and life to all of us uh, in, in Malaysia, I believe. So, well, um, as we know that uh, I still remember the quotes from someone that I know, life is like a box of chocolates you never know what you're going to get. So most people see sometimes health as more important than wealth. But however, wealth provides the opportunity to have a healthier life, providing ability to spend on holidays, uh, might be on sport, gymnasium, and other lifestyle expenses. And today's topic, I think, um, is a right topic for us. Uh, it, it's also important to all of us, including me, myself, and the importance of long-term long -term financial planning where you know that nowadays there is a rising of healthcare costs, uh, not only in Malaysia, but uh, uh, at other countries also. So uh, for those who are actually approaching the retirement uh, uh, period like me, I'm going to uh, less than 10 years, I'm going to be retired soon. So this topic is really actually the, the topic that I should actually attend and hear on some of the ideas on looking at eh, financials, uh, what we call it, uh, freedoms, whether I would like to invest in wealth and health. So uh, sometimes we have to re remember that uh, living longer means more expenditure over a longer term. And this can be reduced, this can reduce the values of overall assets resulting in less wealth to pass on to successes on that and increasingly funds are passed on to support our children during a lifetime. And longevity is prompting investors to act differently. And we, although we are not might be one of the active investors, but to survive in the life, we need to invest somehow. So uh, then the topic today, I hope that all of our students who attend the sessions today and all of our friends, uh, be it, uh, spend your time to hear about this topic from the two experts that we invited, uh, especially for this uh, adjunct professor series session. So before I'm going to end my welcome and speech, so let us follow the wise words of Winston Churchill's, let our advanced worrying become advanced thinking and planning. So make it balance between wealth and health and let us uh, learn from the expert on this topic. So with that, wabilahi taufiq wa hidayah wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Zain Datun, for the welcoming speech. And for me, it's really a beautiful and fruitful uh, advice for us. Ladies and gentlemen, so what is financial freedom means to you? Is it because of this is one of your goals in life? So all your questions will be answered in these sessions. And we are really excited to bring it to you, our FSSH, Asian Professor, our Dato Zunaida Idris, and her invited guest speaker, Mr. Azran Usman Rani, which they will to discuss the important steps on how to achieve your financial stability by investing in the right investment through wealth and health. Okay, 
And just a reminder, if you have any questions along this session, you are pleased to post your comment on our Facebook comment. So we will have our Q&A session with Datuk Zunaida Idris soon. Now, we have come to the main part of our event. But before we start our lecture series from our prominent speaker, whom I believe shall enrich our insight and knowledge regarding the themes of this lecture series, I would like to introduce our Dato Zunaida Idris and Mr. Azran Usman Rani. Hi, Dato and Mr. Azran. Hello. Dato, Assalamualaikum, Dato. All right, so let me introduce our prominent speaker profile. Datuk Zunaida Idris is a deputy chairman of Majlis Datuk Datuk Negara Investment Committee and a former senior vice president of Hong Leong Investment Bank Berhad. So Datuk Zunaida Idris has a vast experience in area of strategic planning business development and has more than 27 years experiences in investment bank with a special focus in area of the stock broking industry. Accomplish her career with strong track record in a highly competitive industry. She is really committed and passionate about the delivering the best throughout her career in the investment bank. So she also the leaders with a vision and patience, and she has successfully built and developed and creating new leaders and talent within her team. Tanish also her interpersonal skills. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam datuk. All right. Assalamualaikum. All right. Waalaikum salam datuk. We we can Salam. hear you datuk. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Okay. Dato, okay, we can hear you, Dato. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Right? So let's proceed with our next invited guest speaker, Mr. Azran Usman Raini. We, I can say that uh, he is really good in this topic as well because uh, Mr. Azran Usman Rani is a CEO and a co-founder of Naluri. He also the author of the books 30 Days and 30 Years Offering Learnings on Entrepreneurship and Resilience from his personal leadership journey. And he also uh, previously the iFlix Group COO and CEO of iFlix Malaysia. So he held previous position at Astro all Asian networks, and he is really an adventure traveler and Ironman charity. All right, so uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome our distinguished speaker to deliver the talk. Dengar tak? Dengar tak? So the, the floor is yours, Dato. Dato, can you hear us? You can, you, you may start now, Dato. Dengar. Okay. Okay. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to everyone and before we start I like to say uh, thank you to the whole team from you know the school of uh, social science and humanities and of course my thank you to dean of the faculty uh, of Social Science and Humanities, that is Professor Dr. Zadatun Tase. I also like to extend my thank you and appreciation to Professor Dr. Siti Aisha Abdul Rahman, Chair of School of Human Resources Development and Psychology. And of course, not forgetting my special guest, Encik Azran Osmara. Rani, thank you, Encik Azran, for accepting our invitation because I can't think of, of anybody else that is perfect uh, to talk about health because I always health is one of the most important uh, thing in our life. It's not just about financial freedom. And thank you to uh, Professor Nase for the doa recital today. And of course, to our beautiful moderator, uh, Dr. Shafika. And okay, so today our title is Financial Firm. So what I want to share with you uh, today, you know, like, I always say when we talk about financial freedom, the first thing that people think about is the finance, the in investment but before we even go to finance or the investment area of uh, financial let's us go back and look at some of the attribute that we need to look at so can we go to the next page the first before i start i like to ask a question to all of you out there what financial freedom means to you. Uh, can we have the second slide, please? Can we have the second slide, please? Assalamu alaikum. Can you call me, Shafika? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Prof. Yes, sir. The pin now that I will look at. Can we have the second slide? Come on. Now that I think we need. Okay, sorry. I just continue. What financial freedom means to you? So I need for you to do is go uh, into. Okay, can everyone who is here, either you are at Facebook or YouTube, can you actually type what financial freedom means to you? No, I need the second slide. They're not showing. Sure. Okay. Okay, so sorry. I, I think there are some technical challenges here. Okay, can, uh, can everyone, you know, just, I want it to make an interactive, so I want to see what is financial freedom means to everyone. You know, everybody actually, we have, we have different needs, we have different ones, our family are different, our financial are different. So our financial freedom means to us. So my financial freedom may be different from uh, Professor Aisha or Pro Professor Shaf or even which has run. So what I'm trying to say here, your financial freedom is yours. You are the one who have to decide 
how you want to craft your financial freedom. So, but before that, there are 10 habits. This, you know, you may have more than 10 that what habits could lead you to financial freedom. Okay, the most important thing, you know, we will go through all 10, but I would just go very briefly. I believe you must have knowledge. Knowledge is always important. And it's not just about financial freedom, but even when you talk about investment, even when you want to talk about what insurance to buy, you have to have knowledge. And knowledge, the second most important thing, we must have goals. You know, in life, is we always must have our goal. It's either goal for our health goal, is either for our finance goal or isn't for our social goal in life. And of course, when we already have the goal, we have to have a budget. So we have to start with a single budget schedule, meaning that we must have a worksheet, we have our own budget. And we will talk about insurance. Later, we will also talk what it is what does investment mean okay i'm going to read one of it one of the uh, someone wrote financial freedom is to live freely without relying on someone else money okay so that is only part of financial freedom but we also need to mention you know it's about covering our debt covering our insurance what happened is something happened to you you know you may have the finance but do you have crafted your total financial freedom that is only one of the end of financial freedom and we also have to talk about lifestyle you know when we talk about financial freedom we have to talk about debt management and we also will talk about mentors and the most important thing later Che Azran will share with us about health. So let, let's start with knowledge. Okay. Get the knowledge to financial freedom. It is very important, even in anything in life, when we want when we talk about financial freedom. Without solid understanding of personal finance, if you don't even have the basic of financial literacy and you don't know how money actually works, it can be near to impossible to achieve your financial freedom. So the basic understanding of financial can do wonders. So the most important thing is we must have right knowledge about personal finance, about investment, about debt management, also about insurance and other matters that is important. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is you must garner proper knowledge for you to be successful in your financial freedom. It's not just about financial freedom. You know, but even in life, you know, knowledge is one of the most important uh, agenda that you need to know. And, you know, I remember there is one quote by Robert Kiyosaki. He's work for money, but work for knowledge. Because knowledge actually will always uh, transfer or translate to wealth. So remember that. So we, we are going to go. Okay. So without knowledge, you know, you cannot invest in something that you don't understand. So that's why knowledge is important. You know, when we talk about financial freedom, you need to know what actually will lead you to financial freedom. It's not just about you going into investment. It's just not a 
about money, but you need to know other habits, other criteria, actually that will help you to be successful in your financial freedom. Never invest in something you have no knowledge. So rule number one, make sure that you at least take an initiative to read a book or now you, are, you guys are very lucky because you can just go to the internet and Google. You know, today I probably will not be able to cover everything, but what I want you to learn is there is this 10 habit that I'm going to share with you today and take the initiative to learn more about this habit that I'm going to share with you. So, knowledge is power. It controls everything. It gives you the access, it gives you the opportunity to your financial freedom. With the right knowledge, you can implement a winning strategy. Knowledge and the right attribute will take you to the journey of financial freedom. What tip, you know, with the knowledge, you know, along the way, you will know what to what to cancel. You know how, what, and when to invest. And also how, what, when, and which insurance to buy. So my number one habit that I like to share with you is for you to be successful in financial freedom, ensure that you garner the right knowledge. So we will go to the second habit, which is goal, your goal. So when we talk about financial freedom or even in other matters, when we talk about goal, we have many goals. Just this. So we have health goals, we have retirement goals, we have growth goals, we even have marriage goal. You know, I'm sure most people would have think about you know marriage and at least you have a goal. So what is important in the first place when you talk about financial freedom, you must have a goal. You must set your goal. When you talk about financial freedom, we will talk about you know, there is, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of a SMART goal. Means that your goal has to be specific, it has to be measurable, it has to be attainable, it has to be realistic, and of course, there must be a time for you to achieve your goal. When you talk about specific, so you must have when you know when you talk about financial freedom, uh, you must imagine you know your goal is that you probably you have a short term goal, you have a medium term goal, and you have a long term goal. For example, you probably said, okay, with the current scenario, with my current uh, salary, you know, we start people who start working probably at a 25 years old, so probably your salary is about uh, 3,000. So probably when you put your goal, this is a short-term goal, you say, okay, I need a million. You know, but as you grow corporate level and your salary will become better and bigger, so probably your goal will change. It probably, you say you want 3 million or 5 million or you want to bounce. So your your goal has to be specific, but it can be flexible. What, but what is important, it, it has to be specific. There's a number that you want, and because of that, there will be action. And for example, your goal is to accumulate wealth worth certain value. So the other one is it has to be measurable. When we talk about measurable, you provide a way to evaluate, use a metric or data targets, five years plan, for example. So you have a, a system where 
you measure your goal and there is a lifetime plan when you talk about you measure you see what happened is that when you measure your goal as you get closer to your goal or at least you see there are some progress in your goal that's when you get motivated you get excited and you probably work harder to achieve your goal and don't forget when you do your goal uh, to be specific under this smart uh, goal ensure your your goal is acceptable to you we you know sometimes we have a goal but then it's not uh, suitable for our social life or our time so the goal that you have have to ensure that you have other obligation and priorities in life that is not going to disrupt your goal so what i'm trying to say for example Uncle, you have to be realistic in terms of uh, when you set your goal. For example, you know, so it has to be attainable and it also has to be realistic. You have to decide whether it is relevant, you know, to you, it suit to your personality, and ensure that you achieve your goal. The question is, why do you want to achieve that goal? what is the objective and is that the reality so you know when you have, have this uh, in order the likelihood of you achieving and working toward your goals are much bigger so the other most important thing talk about goal it has to have time you know everything has to have deadline for example, you know, you need to install deadline for yourself. These deadline are make what most people switch to action. Because if you don't have a deadline, you say, oh, nanti I simpan duit. You know, it's always nanti, beso, or kemudian. But at the end of the day, after you become 40 years old, 50 years old, or if you are 60, then only you realize that you have not, you know, have anything for you to cover you for your financial freedom or even for your retirement. So the most important thing, it is necessary and making the learning path of achieving the goal to have a time limit. So besides, we have spoken about our knowledge, we talk about um, our goal and now, I would like to share, it is very important for you to set a SMART goal. The SMART goal setting can be used in all aspects in your life, as I mentioned, not necessarily only in this financial freedom. You can use the same format for your health, for your family goal, and even for your, your social goal. Okay. So, okay, we go to the next slide. So we are, once we have set, you know, we have the knowledge, we already have set our goal. And of course, the next important habit or that we must have is to have a budget. You know, one of the common mistakes that people done in their life is they don't have a budget worksheet. You may have multiple worksheet and the question is how to make a budget that works. So, you know, when you, you're talking about going into your financial freedom, but now you have a limited resources. So what you need is to start with the budget worksheet. And the question is how to make that budget works for you. So what you need to do when you do a budget, you know, you are planning for your financial freedom. Identify what are the common expenses that you should include in 
budget worksheet. Ensure you have an emergency fund in your budget. And you also need to ensure the budget is your personal, not following some step in formulating your personal budget. When you formulating your budget, make sure you include some fund for three months or six months of your emergency funding. So when we talk about budget, you craft your budget, remember, always bring awareness into your budget. Track your spending. Know where every dollar go, you know, whenever you receive some money. You will never experience freedom when you constantly asking where did my money go so my question here to all of you did you experience that you say oh semalam i borrow you know we draw a uh, 500 ringgit and two days later i don't know where that money goes to so if you actually are one of those people who experience that i think it's about time for you to start to construct your personal budget. Track so you can track your spending and see visually where every dollar goes and you can see that you are able to know where you spend. So once you have, have all that uh, done or you are already start your budget or for some of you probably you already have at least i can tell you that you can already start visualize your financial future is there what i want to share with you when you have budget i can tell you numbers don't lie they will show you where you can make better decision in the budget it will bring a awareness to you about your spending habits and also your patterns so by having the budget and your expenses you will know where you have overspent or where you actually can save and do keep that money for your future with the knowledge that i'm here you probably will be able to have the right checklist when you're constructing your budget. Understand what basic financial living and what needs me. With the knowledge, you know, when you do uh, your budget, you understand what credit card debt means. You also understand money in and money out. The stuff may look very basic, but trust me, it is very important. There are many people out there I can share with you, you know, some of my friends who actually, they earn so much throughout their life. But at the end of the day, when it's close to their retirement, they are struggling you know, to ensure that they have financial freedom. But it's never too late. But it's just that you probably have to put aside more on your savings. So in your budget, understand. You also need to understand what is your fixed expenses. So I'm sure most of you have heard of the 50 30 20 rules must help you know for you someone who is not disciplined someone who likes to spend money trust me this 50 30 20 rules works but for those who have never heard of this 50 30 20 rules i just want to share with you most of the time 50 percent of whatever your income that is coming in is for you to put aside for what is needed, what is necessary, what 
need to be paid first. And the 3022 rules, you can be flexible. You can have 30 for needs, 20 for saving, or you can have 20 needs, 30 for saving. It depends on you. But as, as I mentioned, all this is your, your own, your own budget, you know, your own financial freedom. You decide what you want. So managing the money is very important. So what I want to share with you, managing your money is just as important as earning it. You work so hard to earn the money. So ensure that you manage your money correctly. So if your expenses keep on building up and you are leaving paycheck to paycheck, that is a signal you are on the way to a financial doom. So it's a, if any of you out there are experiencing this, I sincerely ask you, please, start your budget maximizing your income through your budget it is very important and you will see how it will help you you know to change your lifestyle start creating budget have a calendar your budget calendar which should include when you do your budget you know i'm spending more time because i think this is one of the most important uh criteria when you talk about financial freedom so when you do your budget please include life event like your bills payment you know in your calendar mark down your bill dates your salary date other due dates such as your income tax children's school fees your insurance these are all the important due date you know there's a lot of people have missed Many people think that, oh, I've already managed to, pre uh, you know, my financial freedom because I pay my bills on time. But most of them fail to realize to prepare for emergency in case of incident happen. So basically, your budget calendar will be your guideline for your future. So when we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about uh, the criteria that is important, I also like to share with you to talk about savings. I just want to share just a quick one. You know, I was exposed to financial literacy when I was very young. You know, I come from a very middle class family. My father is a policeman and my mother is a housewife. But my mother, my father has taught me about saving. You know, if you know my age, uh, I just retired. So meaning you, you can teach how old I am. And, and, but what I want to share with you, at the early age, we were taught to do saving. But during my time, what if, I mean, some of you who may be my age, you know, you remember where in school they give you a stamp. You know, where you collect like the stamp and then you go to the post office and then the post office will stamp your book. And so you see you got, oh, you got, by the end of the month, you have like $10 or $20. That is when I was only seven years old. So I want to share with you, saving is a good habit. It is a very important habit that every one of you must have, you know, regardless how much you are earning, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, what is important, you must have the habit of, of savings. So when we talk about saving, the most powerful uh, tools in saving is compound interest. Albert Einstein once stated, the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. Start saving when you are young or at least early stage of your life. So when we talk 
about early it's not just when we talk about saving you know everything is good to start early once you know when you start saving young you know you when you see the compounded interest you it is amazing over the course of 20 30 or 40 years of compound interest you will be amazed how much money you save just for the benefit of time allowing money to work for you so invest it when you know when you have accumulated all the savings then you can go into investment you know you never know regardless of amount it is about a thing safety habits is a habit that you need to have as your income grow probably more because saving is already in your system it is already part of your habit is in your uh, saving system okay so when we talk about saving i also want to talk about insurance you know these are one of the most important criteria when we talk about financial freedom you know earlier i mentioned to you that you know a lot of people have this notion oh i pay on my debts you know <coughs> they think that they are safe they are financial free but you need to understand you need to have insurance i want to share with you not to make the same mistake that i made because i do have insurance but it was i started very late so the last 20 years i have to pay quite a huge premium for my insurance so if you have insurance savings early or you buy your insurance early so probably you don't have to pay as much as i have to pay for the last 20 years so i'm sharing this you know despite the fact that you know i start saving but i'm only exposed to financial freedom when i start working in the investment bank so you are okay because i'm sharing with you you are still studying and you know you can start uh you know looking for insurance so when you talk about insurance you know there's a lot of things that you need to look at you have to consider your life insurance your medical insurance your same insurance your education insurance home insurance your car or even your loan you know nowadays the insurance are so sophisticated so when you buy insurance please ensure that you look in all those icons that I have just made. When you want to buy insurance, ensure that you shop around before you decide to buy any insurance. There are many insurance companies. There's a wide variety of coverage, but you may even want to work with an agent instead of buying online because when something happens to you you need an agent who can assist you to ensure that you can redeem your insurance start with the basic needs for example like your home car business health and you know when you buy insurance make sure that it suits your needs today and you build it up as you progress in your life and your career always okay when you buy insurance i like to share with you always ask a question what is exclusion your agent will be able to explain to you the exclusion in the policy which will save you the stress and frustration you know when you bought when you discover after you have bought the policy because a lot of people when i ask them they say oh i bought insurance so that means is it uncovered and they will say is it that i am already ready for financial freedom but the problem is that yes you have insurance 
but did your insurance really cover what is needed? So look at the important key area that you need to insure when buying your insurance. Your insurance provider should provide much more than a policy of a document. You know, maybe they can provide you with risk management advice. Take time, get to know the insurance team and ensure that your insurance policy is sound and it is one of the most important attribute that will contribute to your future financial freedom. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, some of the factors which may determine your insurance is your lifestyle. So, you know, when you buy insurance, you have to look at your lifestyle. Are you involved with a lot of, um, you know, challenging, or high speed sports and your age at what age you are buying your insurance so you know one i want to share about buying insurance insurance doesn't cover you for life even though they say life insurance there is a time limit where they pay for your insurance so ensure that you know your insurance cover you till which age so ensure that your agent actually share with you and of course, you need to know the your existing health condition, your level of coverage, your policy coverage, your saving plan, and your what happened. Does your insurance cover you if there is any permanent disability to you? So, ladies and gentlemen, for the young millennials, you know. I encourage you to start Hurry up. buying your insurance at an Hurry early up. age because it is very important. Hmm? Of course, uh, if you look at the next, you know, it says what to okay, consider. What? Damn it. They are, of course, it, the most important. So I wonder whether you always cover your big hospital bills you know, when you are going into retirement and of course you know consider what if something happened to you will your family be covered so all these are very important for you to consider when you buy insurance so these are the things the reason i have to mention all this because there's a lot of people have misconception you know they thought when we talk about financial freedom it's just about investment investment is one of the important habits but the correct you know the habits that i mentioned is the one that is the pillar of your financial freedom so now we will go into investment. So before you go into investment, you need to know the investment life cycle. So where in you know when you look at it, have a look at it. When you look at your investment life cycle, you can see you know there is a bell curve. So identify at which level of the investor cycle you belong to for example if you are the next slide okay if you are between 20 to 40 i will consider you uh, under the category of accumulation okay so i will go very quickly on investment so what you need to do is that you must know which you know in this investor cycle where are you and from there you will need to identify your position in the investment cycle so if you at a stage you know early stage you are young you are like 20 so that possibility you can go into a high risk but of course it's a high gain but if you are already at in the in the middle we call it moderation so it's an accumulation so you need to look at your investment but investment i can't 
teach you everything today here. We can have a special lecture series just on investment for you to understand over the life cycle. I think my last lecture series when we talk about stock market, I share about investment. So going forward, you know, we will share more on investment. But the other criteria, we go to the next one that is the lifestyle you know this is what actually will influence or cause you to lose your financial freedom it's your lifestyle so get rid of your bad and harmful habits of lifestyle meaning you know if you dine every day you go out shopping you know you are spending more money than what you your earnings so these are all the bad habit and harmful that you need to treat so in order for you to get the financial freedom ladies and gentlemen look at yourself and see what are in your daily lifestyle that you are able to improve you know to change so that you can save more money for your future which we say late gratification because once you have a financial freedom at the age when you retire you can enjoy all the financial freedom and of course i like to touch on debt management you know, we talk about uh, settling the debt, but the most important thing is to look at all the debt. You know, your, you know, you're talking about your car loan debt, your housing loan debt, personal debt. But I'm not going to go into that. I just want to go into your credit card debt. So when you talk about lifestyle, you know, you're spending money that you don't have. So that is one way of of a reason where you will never achieve financial freedom because every month whenever you get your paycheck you end up paying your bills especially your credit card and one of the signals that you need to look at is if you are paying your credit card minimum amount or you are spending your daily expenses on your credit card signal that you are in trouble so if i were you if you are experiencing that please have a checklist have, have a look at your and change your habit change to a better habit have a healthy lifestyle and of course before i end my presentation presentation for today due to the time uh, i would also like uh, to share with just a quick make sure you have a mentor someone who actually who will coach you or someone who will share with you someone who actually will have a comment who are happy for you to achieve your goal someone who will you someone who will guide you someone who will motivate you and someone who will guard you and who will support you if you are delayed in your financial freedom sir so i'm so sorry because of the time i have to end my presentation you are welcome to connect to me via my facebook or my email and without further ado i would like uh, to invite um, our other my special guest for today so before i end find a mentor who will actually not only advise you but also provide clarity and direction for you to achieve your financial freedom and without further ado i like to welcome Encik azran osmarani to share about health so i will not talk about how important health to financial freedom Encik Osmarani. Hi, hi Dr. June. Lovely to reconnect. Um, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, everybody. So thank you again, Dr. Zunaida, for inviting me. Uh, 
Dean of the Faculty, Professor Dr. Zaida Tuntasir. I also want to acknowledge the Chair of the School of Human Resources, Associate Professor Dr. Siti Aisha Abdurrahman, and of course our esteemed moderator, Dr. Shafika, for the privilege of sharing my experiences on this topic of our health and our wealth, and specifically how we can achieve our healthiest and best selves. So um, what I do um, with Nellery is that we are a digital health technology company and we provide behavioral coaching and psychological support for those at risk of chronic conditions like diabetes and heart diseases and cancer, but also depression, anxiety, and stress. And as a digital company that uses a lot of quantitative data, we have seen spikes of 40 to 50% in levels of stress, anxiety, and depression over the last 12 months, working with our clients, arising from the massive uncertainties, economic and financial hardships, and disruptions in our work and lifestyle routines due to this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we're told that we need to develop mental resilience to equip ourselves to handle these pressures and uncertainties. So my goal today is to give you some actionable tips to do so as you plan ahead for 2021. Because if there's anything that we learned from 2020, is that things will not go according to our plan. So to recap, right, 2020 taught us to expect the unexpected. When things don't go according to plan and we encounter unexpected setbacks. And there are usually two things that hold us back. First, we are all oriented to stick to what we're familiar and comfortable. Doing something new makes us uneasy. It's risky, unproven, and there may be more downside than upside. And especially if we've had past successes doing things one way, it becomes harder to change to a different approach. Second, we want other people to change. We think our boss or our client or a family member is wrong and they should change because we believe we are right. But facts don't win arguments. And expecting others to change means we surrender our fate, our happiness, our peace of mind to someone else. And since they're not likely to change, we wallow in our own misery, our frustration, and resentment that eats away inside of us. So fear and complacency from past successes are two main barriers for us. And I wanna share a story for each point, one from my work experience and one from my personal life. Now, as an entrepreneur over the last 15 years, I have faced many unexpected setbacks. I mean, I remember the 97, 98 Asian financial crisis, and then again, trying to start an airline in 2008 and facing the brunt of the global financial crisis where all the banks that had committed to provide aircraft financing all pulled out and left us completely stranded. And in that same year, oil prices went crazy. It had been in the range of $50 to $75 a barrel from 2002 to 2007, and that's what our business plan was based on. But in the six months of 2008, it doubled to $147 a barrel, and oil is 50% of our airline's cost, and no plan could have anticipated this shock. On top of that, all the banks advised airlines to hedge their fuel as a way of mitigating the risk of oil price volatility, and many airlines did, including us. Right. So when we started to lock in the price of oil as it was going up, we locked in $100 a barrel for 12 months, and we were relieved when it peaked at $147 a barrel in June. But another six months later, just by December 2008, it collapsed all the way down to $32 a barrel. And we had locked in oil at $100 a barrel. This caused 50 airlines to go bankrupt. And we narrowly av avoided that fate ourselves because it just so happens the one bank who was the counterparty to our hedging contract, they went bankrupt first. So what a narrow escape. 
right? And every year after that, there was one shock after the other. In 2010, there was the Icelandic volcanic eruption that closed down the entire European airspace for a week, leaving thousands of our passengers stranded in London and Kuala Lumpur. The next year, we started flights to Tokyo and we got hit by the Tohoku earthquake tsunami and nuclear tragedy. The following year, just when we started flights to Christchurch, New Zealand, the city got hit by two earthquakes and we had to pull out of that market. And it wasn't just natural disasters. Every year we had to deal with a difficult policy and regulatory environment with restrictions being imposed on us to limit competition with national airlines. But nothing prepared us for 2014 when we had to deal with not one, not two, but three black swan events. These are events that are so rare and yet have a massive impact. In this case, in March, MH370, a plane went missing. In July, MH17, a plane was shot down. And in December, QZ8501, a fatal plane crash. And although none of these airlines were the ones under me, the impact to the entire industry was brutal with travel demand from China, Australia, our core markets plummeting by almost 50%. Even in my personal life, and this is why, as Dr. Zunai said, we've got to have insurance because nothing goes according to plan. In May 2018, while I was cycling in Kuala Lumpur, a car came from behind and hit me very hard, leaving me unconscious. I woke up in the intensive care unit with fractures on my skull, bleeding in my brain. Three of my four limbs were in a cast. And, you know... It was incredibly painful. You know, sometimes life knocks you down hard. In this case, literally being knocked down hard. And as I lay in that hospital bed, I was overwhelmed with emotion, fear, anxiety, depression. What was going to happen to me? Will I be able to lead a normal life again? What was going to happen to this new business that I had just started? How will I provide for my family? All of us go through these negative emotions when we face setbacks or failures. And I realized there was no way I could answer these big questions. When things are overwhelming, I needed to focus on the smallest things that I could do that were within my control and put aside the worries of the bigger questions. And so with the support of my family and hospital staff, I just focused on learning how to sit up from my bed and to start walking again. So on the seventh day, I started to take my first steps in the ward, even when one of my legs was still fractured and you can see I was very dizzy. But this gave me momentum. I celebrated these small wins. Keep focusing what I can do rather than worry about things that were out of my control. I deliberately stopped thinking about the driver that hit me and told people who asked what happened to him that I don't want to know. And I wasn't angry at him because I wanted to use all my energy to heal and get stronger and not waste it on feeling angry at someone else. And with momentum, I could start walking on the treadmill on day 33 after I was discharged and slowly increasing the time from just five minutes a day to 10 to 15 to 30. And here I want to share how we use behavior goals rather than outcome goals as a way to succeed. Many people focus on outcome goals, especially for New Year resolutions, right? And that's why 80% of New Year resolutions die by February or March from wanting to lose 10 kilos of weight or to save enough for down payment for a house or to get a promotion. Instead, success is higher if we focus on the behavior actions that we do daily and weekly. And by day 47, I could pick up the pace and to start running again on the treadmill. Another tip on goal setting is to frame our behavior goals as action goals rather than avoidance goals. So actions are things that we do daily, like going out for a walk or run, writing in a journal or drinking eight glasses of water, rather than an avoidance goal, like avoid social media or avoid Netflix or avoid nasi lemak. Because when we focus on negative goals, the brain only remembers nasi lama and doesn't register a void. And in my recovery journey, the joy came two months after the accident when I could run outdoors again, that feeling of liberation and elation. 
But an even bigger joy and a big psychological milestone was to get on a bicycle and ride outdoors again with my friends on day 84, less than three months from that accident. Momentum fuels more momentum. And with physiotherapy sessions, five days a week, many of them painful sessions, I worked on getting my shoulder and arm mobility as my broken shoulder healed. And day 112, I could get back the full rotation of my arm and I could start swimming in the pool again. By then, I had a very specific goal in mind. I wanted to get back to Ironman triathlon racing. So I worked with my coaches and kept working on my strength and stamina and signed up for the Ironman triathlon race in Langkawi, Malaysia in November. Now, this is important for me because being a triathlete was a big part of my identity. So on day 174, less than six months from that accident, I was able to complete the Ironman 70.3 Langkawi triathlon, swimming, cycling, and running. My motivation was that I wanted to tell my children, and for the parents out there, you know, our children do not listen to what we tell them. They learn by observing what we do. Same thing with our team members. The message for my children is, life will knock us down hard, very hard, and we can't control what happens to us, but we can decide how we choose to respond. And this is why it's important to understand that our initial reactions and impulses to things that happen to us are automatic and they may limit us. Why is this? Our brain is designed for one primary purpose, to keep us alive, our survival instinct. And the way our brain does this is that it steers us uh, uh, towards things that are familiar, things that are predictable and reliable. It doesn't like things that are unknown, risky or dangerous. Our brain receives 50 million sensory inputs every single moment, and yet it can only consciously process seven or eight. So the brain filters out everything quickly based on these gut instincts. That's why when you meet someone, even before that person has said a single word, your brain has already made a judgment whether you like that person or not. And these quick judgments can be limiting. Because the brain may tell us, oh, we can't do something because it hasn't seen us succeed before. It tells us to stick to doing the same things. And anything dangerous or unknown causes us a lot of stress. It's the brain's warning signs. Danger, danger, danger. But my message to you today is that stress is necessary. We need stress to perform our best. So you don't want to avoid stress, but we need to learn how to respond to it positively. You see, stress is a biological response when the brain wants the body to spring into action. If the brain senses danger, for example, if a lion started to chase an antelope in the savanna, the antelope's body experiences a surge in stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine, to get the heart beat faster, the lungs to expand, the muscles prime for action. And that allows the antelope to sprint away and run away from the lion. Now, the lion who's chasing the antelope also needs to experience stress. Those same stress hormones also makes the lion's heart beat faster, the lungs to expand and the muscles prime for action in order to catch the antelope. Because if the lion doesn't catch its prey for several days, it may starve to death. Now, in today's modern world, hopefully none of you have to experience the threat of a lion chasing you. But today's threat may come from our boss being angry at us or our clients being upset or we experience pressure from sales targets or academic targets or maybe our spouse is unhappy with us or our parents are unhappy at us. We experience the same hormonal reactions as if a lion is chasing after us. So stress occurs whether we are the predator or the prey, but we choose how we respond. We can respond as the prey or victim or we can respond as a predator ready for action. And this is why some people enjoy the thrill of a roller coaster ride or skydiving while other people are deathly afraid of the same thing or even public speaking. 
right? The people who skydive experience the same nervous energy, but they look at it not as something to avoid, but something that they channel into action. So again, we choose how we look at stress. Now, unlike the antelope, right? When the lion stops chasing it, the antelope can go back to grazing again and all the stress hormones dissipate. But for us humans, we've evolved where it's harder for us to let go of the stress feelings once the immediate threats go away. And for some of us, even when the threat has not yet emerged, the boss is not yet angry, the customer is not yet upset, we still have time to achieve our targets or submit the paper, or a spouse is not yet upset, we anticipate that it might happen and it already causes these stress hormones to surge. That is anxiety. Gagalisahan, right? When we become worried about potential threats that have not yet emerged. And when we worry, these videos keep playing in our heads over and over and over again. And for some people, once the threats have passed, we still can't stop the videos from playing in our head. That is what's called depression, kemurungan. When something that has already passed, sometimes long ago, like childhood trauma, the memories keep playing in our heads and we keep feeling depressed. So to illustrate what happens to our bodies when we experience prolonged stress, anxiety, and depression, consider this interesting fact. When I complete an Ironman triathlon race in Langkawi, in that one day of swimming four kilometers, cycling 180 kilometers, and running 42 kilometers, I burn a staggering 6,000 calories. That's like 10 plates of nasi lemak. By the end of the day, I would have lost two to three kilograms of weight. But a world champion chess grandmaster competing in a world championship chess tournament also burns 6,000 calories. That's right, guys. No need to exercise. Just play chess. Clearly, not from the physical activity of moving chess pieces around, but from the brain working really hard, thinking about multiple chess scenarios, 50 moves ahead. Because our brain represents only 2% of our body's weight, but it consumes over 20% of all the calories that we eat. And that is why when we're overwhelmed with stress, anxiety, and depression, with all the negative thoughts playing over and over in our heads, we become physically fatigued and tired. And over time, we become sick with high blood pressure and diabetes and heart diseases. So learning to build resilience and optimism and perseverance requires us to learn how do I control these videos playing in our heads of those anxious thoughts of the future or depressed thoughts of the past. Now, it's important for us to be aware of the early signs and symptoms of burnout that can lead to depression and anxiety from prolonged stress and pressure. These include signs of physical fatigue, like soreness, muscle tightness, or irregular sleep due to insomnia, not enough sleep, or hypersomnia, too much sleep, if you've been sleeping more than nine hours a night, four nights in a row, because sleep's function is to rejuvenate and maintain our brain health. Appetite changes, right? Either not eating or suddenly eating too much is another indicator, as is significant mood swings, suddenly becoming short-tempered, quickly irritable outbursts, fever, dizziness, sickness, and also disengagement especially in the work context when people make promises to deliver work and they don't deliver or they stop responding to chat messages and stop contributing to team meetings. So my company, Nullery, has been helping dozens and dozens of companies in Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia to tackle health using digital programs. We start by quantifying mental health. And after assessing over 20,000 employees, we see that about 40% of them have elevated levels of depression, 60% have elevated levels of anxiety, and 30% have elevated levels of stress, but at different degrees. Some are mild and moderate, but about 8 to 12% have severe levels where they're no longer able to function normally at their work or in their personal lives. And because we take an integrated approach to health, we also measure physical health markers like weight, blood sugar, cholesterol, and blood pressure. And you can see similar levels of prevalence for those with elevated risks of chronic diseases. And when we put them together, we see clear correlations between mental health and physical health. 
And when we provide support that integrates both physical and mental health, we can see significant success rates of health improvements. Now, generational differences between young millennials under 30 and those above 40 are very, very prominent, right? So when you look at the data and you split it by age, you realize that the under 30s are experiencing between 40 to 70% higher levels of stress, anxiety, depression. And one of the major causes is financial stress because cost of living have been going up much, much more than wages and salaries. Now, technology has also created a proliferation of overwhelming choice. Too many shopping choices, too many television choices, too many social media choices, nonstop bombardment of notifications, right? Because you keep bouncing from one app to the other, one website to the other, one application to the other, that creates cognitive fatigue, right? And so what do we do about it? If we want to build mental fitness, if we want to build resilience, optimism, focus, curiosity, and social connectedness, it's not going to happen by chance, nor will it suddenly appear just because you listen to one webinar, right? It's like if we go to the gym today and we spent two hours lifting weights, all you're going to get are sore muscles and you swear you'll never set foot in that gym again. Strength comes from daily or regular routines and practices, and it applies the same to both physical strength and fitness as well as mental fitness and resilience. So here are some things to share on how we build our mental fitness, right? Now, we've all heard of mindfulness or meditation exercises. These are exercises to train our focus and concentration on what we're doing in the present to minimize those anxious thoughts of the future or depressive thoughts of the past. Now, you might think, I don't have time to add mindfulness exercises to my daily routine, but you can actually practice mindfulness in your existing tasks, right? If you spend 25 minutes writing a report, shut down all notifications and put away your phone. If you're doing emails, do it in batches and then close the browser and move on to another task and don't come back to email for the next four hours. Even when you're having dinner with your families tonight, learn to have dinner and be present with the families instead of trying to simultaneously send WhatsApp messages while you eat or watch TV while you eat. Exercise also plays an important part in getting our body better able to handle stress and pressure. But some exercises are better for stress management than others. What counts is regular exercise, five to six times a week, even if some days it's only for 10 minutes rather than doing two hours once a week and doing it at the right heart rate intensity, not too low and not too intense, generally about 120 to 140 beats per minute because it's at this intensity that works best for the dentate gyrus in our hippocampus in our brain, whose function is to regulate and stabilize our moods. Sleep is also crucial for stress management. Remember what I shared earlier about minimizing those anxious thoughts of the future or depressive thoughts of the past? Well, just like developing physically stronger muscles after workout, that happens when you sleep. Same thing with mental fitness, because when we sleep, there are these glial cells in our brains that act like a gardener taking out weeds from the garden. It prunes away those anxious or depressive thoughts that are ruminating in your head. And that's why many of us feel much more clear-headed after a good night's sleep, right? So it's so important to embed specific sleep habits uh, as part of our health routine. Now, one final point to add on mental fitness and resilience. Most of us are familiar with stress-induced hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine that get our heart to beat faster, our lungs to expand, our muscles prime, our pupils dilate and focus. But our bodies are also sending out another hormone, oxytocin. Oxytocin is also called the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. It helps build human bonds of connection. It surges through a mother with a newborn baby. Why? Because for thousands of years, humans evolved to deal with threats from the coldest winters, the harshest droughts, when we were attacked by predators or attacked by enemies, the way we survived was that we bonded together as a tribe. When we're alone, we're much less likely to survive. So human connection is a critical part of building mental fitness and resilience. So choosing to spend time with positive people makes all the difference. And in today's modern society, we see that when people try to change and overcome stress, when they try to kind of do habits on their own, only 20% are likely to succeed. That is why, you know, most 
New Year's resolutions fail. Most people who start a diet fail. But what we see is when you get proper support and encouragement from a coach, your chance of success triples to about 60%. And that's why top athletes like Lewis Hamilton, Usain Bolt, the Liverpool team, or the New Zealand All Blacks know that the key to achieving top performance is to work with psychologists to be mentally fit, the most resilient, the most focused, and the most able to handle stress and pressure. Because their equipment is the same, physical training is similar, diet is the same, but at the highest levels of competition, what separates the champion from the runner-up is often mental fitness. And that's why we built Naluri as a way to provide professional support and care for everyone, right? In a much more convenient manner where it's all about having your own psychologist, your own dietitian, your own doctors, your own fitness coaches. But we even added executive coaches because a lot of stress comes from workplace related stress. And we added financial planners because people need specific tangible advice on how do I deal with all the financial pressures in our lives, right? And so we created an um, e-learning curriculum so that you can learn all these things conveniently in bite-sized five-minute modules, there's a thought journal to help you record the emotions that you're facing so that your coaching team can help guide you through all the challenges. A food journal to record all your foods where the AI recognizes the difference between roti chanai versus chapati versus tose. But professional dietitians still guide you through that process because as you make better choices with what you eat, your mental health also improves. As your weight and blood pressure and blood sugar improves, your depression and anxiety comes down. There are also planners, reminders, notifications, because again, change doesn't happen from just one intent or willpower, but it's the small daily and weekly behavioral changes that we do with constant reminders and constant support. That's what's going to get us through these big challenges. So with that, I thank you very much. Thank you for your patience and look forward to any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Shafika. Wow, it's really fruitful talk that we have from our both prominent speaker for these sessions, today's sessions. Actually, I do really love uh, in terms of what Datuk said in terms of 50, 30, 20 rules just now. And I think that this is perhaps this is one of the things that uh, for me uh, should should do right better in in my life okay to ensure that i can follow all the steps that you have uh, told us okay and thank you so much mr azran for your very beautiful story for your in in your life and exactly the way how we need to think positively in our life eh, when we are having so much pressure and stress in our life right so perhaps uh for the participant in facebook because of uh, due to uh, our technical problems, perhaps we can have uh, uh, questions eh, that you can email directly to Dato as well as Mr. Azran. So before that, Dato and Mr. Azran, if you have any final uh, the impactful words that you can give it to us for this topic, Dato. Assalamualaikum and <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chia Azran. Uh, Chia, you know, I just want to share, Chia Azran has always been very inspiring. He's one of the person that I really follow because, you know, when you talk about health and you talk about positive, D man is Chia Azran. Okay, anyway, for my last, for as, for as we talk about financial freedom, you know, I have shared with you the 10 attributes or 10 habits you know, we don't have the time to go through all, but please, like I said, you know, you guys are very lucky because there is a technology, you know, you can look at, you can read more books on, you can also go into Google, you can also go into YouTube, and there's a lot of videos that talk about financial freedom. Please make use of the technology and of course i'm open if you want to connect to me via facebook or even via my email my email i've already shared with our professor and i hand it over to azran all right thank Mr. you azran. very much Dr. Z uh, Dr. Zanida. um all i can say is 
you know, at the end of the day, remember most people hear webinars like this and they get excited, but tomorrow it's the same routine, same things, nothing has changed. So if you're going to beat that cycle, decide now, not in one hour's time, decide now, what's the one thing that you're going to do differently immediately? What is the one person that you're going to reach out to and connect to build support or get knowledge? Do it now, not one hour from now, not tomorrow. All right. I really love the words of do it now. All right. So before we adjourn from this afternoon event, do not forget to subscribe, like, and share our YouTube and FSSH Facebook page. And I do hope that, that all of you guys can stay tuned for our next lecture series. Assalamualaikum and bye, everyone.